this. Um, my basically my entire career has has depended on the awkward relationship between scholarly researchers and and journalists, and uh, and I've I've had to navigate it in a number of different ways. And I would say it's a it's a very imperfect relationship in Canada. Um, there are only a few people doing academic research who are who are consulted very regularly by the media and who contribute very regularly to the media uh, and a lot of a lot of the most important and newsworthy and interesting work gets overlooked or underappreciated or misused a lot of my work has has consisted of uh, galloping through the journals and 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 finding people's interesting research and and uh, and Simplifying it and cherry picking the most newsworthy things from it, and uh, and hopefully not distorting it and and uh, and, get, and you know, mischaracterizing it too much. But but that's never a perfect way uh, to relate. I think I think the most difficult form of relationship between s scholars and the media is is the the need for a talking head. And I think I think if I would offer a first piece of advice, it's that the rela what the relationship you want to avoid is the one where you are sought out by somebody who doesn't know you simply because of the line in italics <coughs> under your name on the university website. So for and this usually happens more often on television, but in the print media as well, when there's some breaking news and they want an expert. And uh, perhaps you've done years of scholarship on labor relations in Southern Europe and so on, and uh, suddenly a news story breaks that Slovenia is pulling out of the European Union. And suddenly you find a television station phoning you and saying, can we do an interview outside your office? And then they're asking you, why, did Slovenia, why is Slovenia pulling out of the European Union? What other countries are going to be doing this? How's this going to affect uh, uh, Britain or something like that and it bears no relationship to your own scholarship or your own work but you're speaking because you're the Europe expert and maybe somebody at the University Media Relations Office has has <coughs> pointed a journalist to you because you're the Europe expert or something like that I think many of you have probably had some version of that experience where you're, you're expected to be the talking head on on something that is only very tangentially related to your work now the the ways to get around that, and I'll talk about that a little bit, are to try to develop position, a position where you have relationships that pre-exist with the media, uh, that both allow that, that allow your work to be respected and noticed uh, by the people who are the gatekeepers, by the people who are the reporters. So the hats I have worn in in this relationship are two. I've I've been a writer who has drawn heavily on people's research. Uh, certainly in the field of, uh, in a lot of European fields, because I ran the European Bureau for a decade and was, was, was very interested in a lot of research coming out of Canada. Um, and then second of all, sometimes as a gatekeeper, as an editor who tries to get scholars into print in writing opinion pieces and essays and so on. This is an increasingly important role in the remaining vestiges of the print media in Canada, you could say. Uh, the Globe and Mail has restructured itself, so its main weekend section is the opinion section, which basically is being structured as an essay section. Uh, so there's a lot of material and there's a lot of desire to have people doing relevant and timely academic research be the, be the voices and writers. Now, I should say in this role as an editor, there are a number of ways we draw upon scholars. One way is that we need we, is that I spend a, a lot of time. I set up I set up the Globe and Mail's online opinion operation, which is sort of the core of the entire opinion operation now. Um, and uh, which is to say that most opinion writing, most essay writing, most op eds uh, today are designed to run online immediately. And then the print newspaper is a digest of what has been published in the main newspaper platform, which is which is the web and mobile devices. 
This does not mean that we're running extremely short articles or that most media are. One of the interesting paradoxes of the rise of social media has been a greatly increased appetite among readers for longer uh, articles. Um, we noticed starting about five years ago that the rise of Twitter had created a greater appetite for articles of 3,000 to 5,000 words. Uh, because what do people use Twitter for? other than listening to the president's uh, disjunctions. They use it to circulate links to longer articles that are of interest. So we're, 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 not, in a, we're not in a situation where the readership is dumbing down or is, or is going for shorter and shorter uh, bites of information. Uh, it's an interesting marketplace of journalistic ideas right now. On the other hand, rapidity is important. And a large part of what I spent a lot of time cultivating were people who were, were respected scholars who could write an intelligent short essay or op-ed piece, so something 700 words, <clears throat> the day that something happened. Um, and, and there are people who can do this. And often very quickly. Sometimes if there was interesting news, I, I would know five or six people in political science um, who could turn around a 500 word piece in a couple hours, which is very desirable. Uh, readers, readers are very interested in that then, which could then be expanded later in the afternoon to a full you know, 800 or 1,000 word article. Now, when that sort of call comes, and usually that call comes because you have an established relationship, with, with editors, and not everybody wants to do that. Uh, um, you have to think quickly. You have to think, how does my own work and the work that I'm aware of that my colleagues are doing mesh with this thing that's going on right now in a way that allows me to showcase some of this stuff while being, while being relevant to it? And that's always a difficult calculation because, of course, what you're doing and what you specialize in and what, what your colleagues specialize in is never going to perfectly mesh with the particular topic of interest that's happening then. But you can often draw upon things. And some people really flourish in that environment of pressure. Now, what I would suggest, um, if you're interested in a better role, and I, I'm really trying to work with the universities now to try to get more, more voices in scholarship uh, engage with the media. There aren't that many people who want to be the sort of person who's called regularly to write a piece in a few hours. But there are, there are certainly a lot of people, first of all, whose, whose work is of news interest or is of, is, is of interest to a broader public and who don't know how to, how to most effectively get that work up into the newspaper or, or of interest to journalists. And second of all, there are, pe there are people who, whose work meshes with public policy debates, with, uh, with comparative international situations, uh, with, uh, uh, with current politics in Canada and the world, uh, who would like to write something for the newspaper uh, and don't know how. So just a couple of quick thoughts about improving that relationship because I, I'm, there, are, there, is, there are a shortage of people who consider themselves public intellectuals as such, who are, who, are, who are happy to write both short essays for newspapers and, and their, their, their peer-reviewed papers and books for, for academic use. But that, that number, I, I say Canada still is a couple decades behind the United States in cultivating a large enough, enough body of, of people who are interested in this. A lot of the universities now have much more proactive uh, media offices. A lot of the institutes within universities now include in their uh, annual assessment of their fellows and residents uh, uh, account of how many media hits they've been able to get, which is, which is beneficial. On the other hand, we, we often have problems with that because you can always tell when a university, somebody in, a, in, a, in an institute is trying to meet a quota. <laughs> and suddenly, suddenly there's a large amount of stuff being thrown, thrown your way as an editor. Uh, that isn't necessarily that useful. So what I would what I would say we need we all need to work on more is the building up of relationships in advance so that the interchange between 
scholars and their research and journalists who are using that research, who are, who are helping scholars turn it into essays for newspapers, who are quoting it and summarizing it, can be respectful and mutually beneficial rather than, rather than awkward and simplifying and, uh, and, and difficult. So it's worth considering when you begin a research initiative, thinking about how, how you would like it to reach the wider public. Um, not after it's published, uh, but when you're beginning the research, when you have, when you have a hunch of where it's, where it's headed, um, and thinking about who to be talking to. Is this paper you're developing going to be interest, of interest to the international affairs, the world section of a newspaper? Is it going to be something that will create new news about something? Um, is it something that's going to create a new perspective that's going to be of interest? It's worth surveying the field to look at the writers who are writing about these things, who may be interested in taking your work and, and, and popularizing it. Um, reporters and, and writers and columnists and so on like to be cold called. Uh, it's, it's, so it's worth reaching out and saying, I'm going to be doing this in a few months. Um, it may be worth discussing, allowing somebody to write about it before the peer review process is complete. I mean, one of the big problems, of course, is that uh, often your work is of great relevance to current events several months before it's actually going to be published uh, in a journal. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable to, to allow people to, to, to write about it in the media before it's completely through that process. As long as you establish the barriers and guidelines, you might want to say, Let's not put a hard number on this thing because, because it has not yet been peer-reviewed. Peer Maybe you can qualify this a bit and so on. But I've, I've, I've had a lot of use with that, particularly because those time frames often stretch out much further than you anticipate. What you think is going to be publishable in two months, and it ends up being a year in two months. And, uh, and there's, there's a great public appetite for that material. It's worth building up relationships with editors. Um, if you think... If you think there's something that you could write that would contribute to the current debate, the way to frame this mentally as you're working on your research is not to think, I have this, I have this new piece of, uh, th these new conclusions that are of great interest within my, my sub-discipline, but rather thinking, okay, what are the debates right now that are going on in public policy, that are going on in media? Um, and how can I figure out a way to attune the research I'm doing so that it speaks to that? That doesn't mean changing what you're doing, but it means finding sometimes a secondary note within it that's, that's relevant to those things. Often the, often the things that are of most interest to editors at newspapers and so on are, are, are not necessarily your headline conclusion, but are something uh, along the way that's, that may seem secondary within your own discipline but may be of greater interest to the general public. Um, a, a lot of, reinventing the wheel often works very well for getting attention to your work. Often the thing that, you're, that, you're, that is included in your research that to you feels like a re reiteration of something that has been concluded and studied over the last decade repeatedly is the thing that the general public doesn't know about. Uh, about politics, about parties, about demographics, about voters, about about, uh, about about these things. Never assume that the thing that, that everyone in your discipline knows is known to, to the general public. Um, and sometimes being very basic uh, uh, can help a lot. But build up relationships with editors. That doesn't mean go write an, go write an essay and send it in. Um, but it does mean send an email, find out who the relevant people are, um, and, and say, would you be interested in, in, in something on this? Um, and uh, so, so in conclusion, I would say what we all need to learn to do a little bit more is build up our relationships earlier in the game. Um, make people aware of the research you're doing. Uh, don't assume that it's, that, it's, uh, that it's only of interest within your sub-discipline because, because it's, it's, uh, it's making an in incremental contribution to an ongoing debate. Uh, recognize that there are not a lot of other people probably who are saying the things that need to be said that are coming out of the work that's being done in your field. 
um, and, and that you could be the person who's, who's doing that. That it can take up some of your time. Sometimes, particularly at this time of year, it's not, it's not necessarily great to be wasting a couple of days doing something for a newspaper that's not going to contribute to, you know, to, to your tenure track or something like that. But on the other hand, there's much greater value in reaching a general public audience now. Institutions are valuing that much more. And at least the, the better parts of the media now are depending much more on people doing really serious, hard research now. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a historic moment when I think a lot of the media have returned to uh, solid and respectable scholarship as their source of, of information at a moment when people in various parts of the political sphere around the world are challenging uh, solid knowledge, uh, are trying to rely on, on, on rhetoric and, and manufactured <coughs> truths and things like that. And so there is, there's a much greater appetite among editors, among journalists right now, in building better relationships with people who are doing real work on the ground with, with real facts and, and real scholarship. So I hope we can help build that relationship. Thank you.